All right, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest is a scientist, at least a student, doing his PhD in biomedical engineering. Brian, how's yeah. it going, brother? Yo, it's good. I'm good. so happy to be on this. Thanks, man. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, he studies at the University of Utah. Yep. Um, we're talking off air. We're talking about a whole spectrum of things like consciousness, um, epilepsy. He works with uh, specializing in epilepsy and how to cure that. Yeah. Tell us a little more about it. So uh, right now, uh, like 1% of the world has epilepsy. And most of them get treated with uh, medication. But if that doesn't work, then they uh, try to remove the part of the brain where that epilepsy comes from. And they do this by having patients stay in the hospital for like a week, have these metal wires implanted in the brain wherever they think the seizures might be coming from, uh, record them for like a week. And if it comes from a single spot, like a focal seizure, then they'll remove that spot and the patient will be good. Uh, this isn't always possible because, like, what if that spot is responsible for, like, your ability to talk or... Like, or your ability to remember things? Yeah. yeah. Or to move. Yeah, like, that's... A, you yeah, can't that's remove that. So the uh, treatment is to uh, do long-term stimulation instead. And that's what I'm studying. How to shock the brain with small shocks that'll treat uh, epilepsy. So you probe their brain and you see what happens. Yep. Okay, got it. Yeah. <clears throat> for the greater good of science and humanity. Mm -hmm. And so this has been around for like 60 years. We've been able to go inside the brain and do this for a long time. It's only recently that we've been bringing in more engineering approaches. We can like take medical images of the brain, mm -hmm. create these mathematical models of how seizures spread, understand how a shock uh, changes brain activity, and that's uh, where I'm coming in. I want to uh, understand how shocking the brain in specific ways treats this. And I want to understand where consciousness comes from, bro, yeah, and so how that works. Hot. Let's go into that, dude. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's like the hot button topic of neuroscience right now. And consciousness. So, yep. Yeah. And like we f don't fully understand it. Mm -hmm. But the like two guiding principles that we've used to get some idea about consciousness is this idea of necessity and sufficiency. So necessity is if you remove a piece of the brain and you lose the ability to do something, then clearly that brain region was necessary to do something. But it's not sufficient. Sufficient means what are all the components to do something. So an example would be like uh, move your finger. If I move the part of your brain that's responsible for moving your finger, you won't be able to do that anymore. But then okay. it turns out that like, oh, there's another area of the brain that can move your hand in general. Is that does that have so to do like, with uh, if you take that part out, there's like a, a faulty um, program? No, it's like it, you, you don't even have the program in the first place now if you remove it. Isn't there like a backup program in a sense? Yeah, there's – yeah. There's exactly. a backup program to the program yeah. in your brain. Yeah. That's it's, crazy. And so the brain kind of is redundant. So it'll have multiple uh, mappings to do things. That's awesome, bro. Yeah. And That's awesome. What if you take out the second part? Is there a third part uh, yeah. that might adjust? Really? So your brain just keeps on evolving? Well, uh, yeah, in a sense. Um, so there are these patients who, uh, like, they'll, they were in war and they, uh, uh, shrapnel took off their arm. You talking about phantom yeah. limbs? Yeah, phantom limbs, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so um, uh, after they lose the arm, uh, the mapping in their brain, uh, the part that – so like in your brain, there's the somatosensory cortex. Okay. And in it, it's ha uh, it maps how neurons from your brain go out to all the sections of your body. And it goes from the feet all the way up, and then it has to make a decision here of either going up to your head or out to your hands. And so it goes out to your hands, and then it jumps to your head. And so when you have a phantom limb and you lose this arm, uh, the neurons that were near that part of the brain are, is the head and also the lower arm uh -huh. or the rest of the arm. And so what happens with these patients is like if you touch their face, they'll feel something on their arm. Yeah. Or they might have like a sensation on their arm, but the arm's no longer there. Don't they also have like pain in their arm when the arm's not there? Yeah. Don't they do something where they put a mirror like in the middle? Yeah, the mirror box. The uh, mirror box. Okay. Yep. I read about that like 15 so, years ago. Bro. Yeah. V.S. Ramachandran. Ooh. He uh, 
he found this out and he was like taking like um the thing that uh the like the wood palette that doctors put in your mouth to make you go ah whatever so he took that and just like rubbed it on their face and found out that uh the neurons in your brain are plastic which means they change and so it wasn't getting signal from the hand anymore so the neurons for the face were growing out into what used to be the hand region and so when you touch the face it was now activating the hand nice and uh, interesting that sensation is crazy to think about. yeah that is that is pretty crazy to think about yeah as far as consciousness goes yeah where did consciousness come from i think therefore i am so yeah. Yeah, so where does it come from? We don't fully know, but the, the back to the necessity and sufficiency thing, mm -hmm. one way to understand parts of consciousness is to remove pieces of the brain and see how it functions without them. And so, like, some, uh, we don't actually remove it, but there was this giant world war, World War II, where the bullets were going fast enough to just go into and out of the brain like a precise neurosurgeon just slicing through parts of the brain and people live yeah and people would survive these okay yeah and so from their survivals from their change in behavior we knew what they were bullet went through the brain took out a piece of the brain we know what they are now and we can see oh maybe this part of the brain was responsible for this function isn't there a famous study of a, a railroad worker where yeah. uh, like the rod went through him something carnage yeah. or carnage hm gauge gauge yeah I okay believe. or uh, something went through his eye right like just yeah so he was a railroad worker using dynamite. It exploded. The rod went right up through his skull. And uh, everyone called him a cheery, normal fellow beforehand. Yeah, he but was then, a douchebag, right? Yeah, afterwards. <laughs> yeah. It took out his uh, impulse control. And now he just became very impulsive. He became very impulsive. Okay, yeah. yeah and I guess like he, he wouldn't think. There's no filter, I guess, in his brain. Yeah. Can you zap people's brains and change their consciousness? Like different... Levels of consciousness? Is that possible? Kind of. Like, another form of consciousness is, like, your ability to have working memory, in a sense. Working memory? And to, uh, working memory is, like, how many ideas can you keep in your mind all together right now? And, like, if you look at chess players, they'll be able to memorize and hold in, like, a whole war game's worth of yeah. moves. Or a taxi driver. Yeah, a taxi. They can see the whole city, right? Yeah. Um, so kind of, and there were stu st studies showing that like, if you put some stimulation inside your temporal cortex, like right around here, right that's, by your eye yeah, on the like right side right of your above, eye. Okay. Yeah. On both sides where the temples are. Mm -hmm. So those temple areas behind them, when boxers get hit and they lose their memory, yeah. that's because you're hitting the temporal lobe and they can't form a memory in the first place. It got squished. So their brain just like shuts off for a second. Um, so that same region um, can help you remember stuff. And uh, if you put a s electrode in there and turn it on uh, while you're trying to remember stuff, uh, it can improve that. Okay. And we've shown that for like, uh, I think it was like the U.S. Uh, it was tr uh, U.S. government was trying to train its snipers better uh -huh. to better able to memorize by doing transcranial direct current stimulation, that's when you put something on the outside of the brain and shock your way in to um, help remember better. Yeah. I think I heard uh, they even have it on Amazon where they have like caps where like for students that want to study or cram, yeah, it zaps it and like uh, apparently it's like Red Bull and Adderall and a bunch of stuff in your brain, but you're zapping it. So yeah. you learn better. Is that, is that accurate? So here's the problem with that. We did a computational model. You guys that. did a study. Yeah. Well, we just did it for a class and mm -hmm. we looked at how much current's actually getting into the brain mm -hmm. and unfortunately it kind of seems like bullshit like, it kind of seems like bullshit yeah there's not enough current going into the brain to really affect it you need something further inside the brain or a stronger amount of stimulation to actually change it okay so but it is possible let's just say you put something that you put a probe inside their brain and you zap it strong enough you can actually help them learn faster and better yeah potentially yeah is there studies done on that or uh, at all uh in rats yes in humans intracranially uh not that i know of Maybe. oh actually except the working memory study they kind of improved it but they did it for a short period of time during the study what i'm wanting to see is like a long period of time like mm -hmm. 10 years 
how much smarter does that person get? That kind of study hasn't really been done. No. Okay. Well, that's kind of hard to tell how much smarter they get, right? Like, is it like working memory? Is it their ability to function, move, talk, yeah, um, but, control behavior? Yeah. But maybe, yeah, that's why it's hard. So yeah. the scientist in me is going to retroactively pull back and be like, we don't know. We, okay, but that's that. I want to believe that's true. I want to believe that we can do that. One yeah, I mean, you could definitely awesome. do it, bro. I mean, uh, there has to be some ethical aspects of it. Yeah. Oh, tell me some of the ethical aspects. Like, what's like unethical to oh. do when you're probing someone's brain? Uh, okay, so back in the day when uh, J- about JFK's period, uh, there was this scientist who discovered that if you remove the frontal lo- uh, lobe, you can re- pacify patients. Frontal lobe, the front part of your lobe, the yeah, prefrontal the f- cortex. Yeah, so the front of your head inside here if you remove part of it you can pacify patients pacify it, like uh you make calm them, like, them down and make them like sweet permanently nice. yeah are they able to function the same that's the problem so at first we were like oh the, we can take our most wild patients mm-hmm. and just calm them down with this right but it turns out frontal lobotomies do not work the scientist who studied this he uh, won a Nobel Prize, oh, and it shit. is the most shameful Nobel Prize in my field. Really? Because it's completely incorrect. You're just, they literally took an ice pick, put it up behind your eyelids, uh-huh. broke through the floor of the skull, and then just scratched away the front of your brain. And it does not work. We were pacifying patients because we were literally, like, just <laughs> barbarically removing the front part of their brain. Where the field is now is way, way ahead of that, but it's far from perfect. Where we are now is we take uh, patients, we do a bunch of behavioral tests, psychological tests, neurological tests, and try to figure out where uh, the epilepsy is coming from. We put them in an imaging scan to understand uh, how their brain, uh, t- uh, how blood flows through the brain, so you can understand what parts of the brain are active. Speaking of which, um, for ADHD yeah. and ADD, does it have to do with the flow of blood in your brain? Uh, no, it kind of seems like uh, the attention part of your brain is hampered and that you over-focus on certain things and you under-focus on other things. And that, uh, whereas like most people have the ability to tune in and out willingly and into things they uh, want to be interested in, ADHD people will just... Um, be just distracted by a, a smaller, uh, just like random noise in their environment. Um, I'm not a full expert on that, no so problem. I can't tell you All right. no much problem, further brother. than that. But yeah. I can tell you that it's like more of a the attention <clears throat> circuit is troubled. Okay. One no, one question I have. Uh, I don't know. This might fall into sci-fi, but how far have we, how far are we from taking consciousness, someone's consciousness, putting it into a machine? Or someone else. Is that possible? Um, so we, ha- it's still sci-fi. But we're starting to create machines that can understand people's emotions and to such a scary extent that maybe we can make a machine that emulates a human being. Not perfectly mimics them, but just copies them so well that it's hard to distinguish the two. Um, but isn't there like emotions and stuff thrown in there from childhood that might cross certain things that the machine hasn't picked up on? Yeah. Yeah. There's stuff like that. Yeah. But what I'm talking about more is like language. language. We've made machines that like if you were to speak with them, yeah, they would be able to tell what from what you're saying how happy you are, how sad you are, and uh, how uh, like the emotional content yeah. of your language. They sell that stuff on Amazon actually. There's like a bracelet. Yeah. 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 I was thinking about so, buying one for work, but I was like, nah, dude, that's so intrusive. <laughs> this, this is a little different from the bracelets because it's more like a deep learning algorithm trying mm-hmm. to understand your emotion. But um, yeah, it's on, on the same side. It's nowhere near like the sci fi aspect of being able to pull someone to another body yet. Do you think that's possible? What? In like 50 years from now? Oh, man. I. I hope it would be possible. <laughs> Not because it's scary, but because like if you're locked in your body, mm-hmm. that could really be a great treatment. Like, Have you ever read the book The Diving Bell? No. The Butterfly and the Diving Bell? No. It's about this guy who was locked into his body, and the only thing he could do was blink. Oh, I read about Yeah. It wasn't a model, 
And then he had everything in life, the kids, the wife, and he was rich. And then he had some seizure, right, or something like that, or some accident? I I think it was an accident. I can't remember how he got locked in syndrome, but I know that once he had it, he was able to communicate with his nurse by blinking and looking at letters. And he wrote a book, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and by then, blinking? Yeah. Oh. So difficult. And he was short, passed away shortly after the book was published, which is sad. But um, he, uh, like... For those kinds of patients, the ability to transfer consciousness would be so useful. Um, however, how far away we are from that is a very long way uh, right now. Like right now, the core uh, concept we want to figure out is that there are so many things we can do with a uh, small wire in the brain. We just need to figure out what does it do on a basic level? How are we changing so the brain? So technically, we haven't even fully mapped out the brain. Uh, yeah, we haven't fully, fully parsed it out. We're getting there. We're trying to understand the brain at a neuron by neuron all the way up to the full brain level, but we're not there yet. What is the problem? Is there like too many factors like emotion, feeling, environment, internal factors, diet, the so, air you breathe? Uh, there's that. There's the fact that you have 86 billion neurons in your oh, brain. Oh, yeah, that too. It's so <laughs> big. And then 100 trillion connections between each of those neurons such a complicated computer just sitting right there um and uh it's also the issue that like we don't know how it develops from the initial just single neuron state all the way out to the full 86 billion neurons and right now like when we put these wires in the brain what we're recording is like tens of thousands of neurons active at the same time um and we use this population of neurons to estimate something about the brain. We also have like these way smaller electrodes called microelectrodes that can measure like single neurons at a time. And so we're doing this at a small scale, but there's like companies out there that are trying to revolutionize this, like Neuralink, mm. and they're trying to make devices that can record these small scales and large scales faster and more numerously and wirelessly and just create like a hardware revolution so we can catch up and do like all these new and broader experiments it's hey, super fascinating anything's possible brother if you yeah. ask me if 30 40 years ago iphones if i try to show it to someone they would burn me yeah <laughs> for being a witch yeah. and i have a podcast called magic or science yeah. <laughs> so now it's like do you can do anything i could turn on my tv i could turn on the heat downstairs i could check how much gas i have in my car it's crazy i yeah. call people yeah and just touch imagine that you could probably think it right and how far are we from that just from like, thinking and then having someone else read it out? Um, or just uh, controlling machines by thinking. Oh, we're there. We're there? Yeah, we're already there. So we have basic stuff to do that. So we know the, the, the cool part is that we have this motor cortex and motor being movement. Um, so we, if we put electrodes there, we can think about doing a movement in our body. But the cool thing about doing a movement in your body is it's pretty controlled. So we can put electrodes in the brain, have you do a hand movement, and then have the computer register that as like one of its movements. Like maybe the computer just picks up an apple. Yeah. So uh, you as a human think about picking up an apple and the robot arm picks up the apple because it learns how your arm moves. Okay. How, how you think about moving that arm. Okay. Is, um, is there going to be something probed into your brain or just like a cap you put on? So it's a, it's a probe into the brain that oh, does this. Okay. We were able to do this back in the 90s. And then Neuralink was able to do this with its electrodes a few years ago. They show like this video of a ape who's like uh, playing a uh -huh. Tetris, uh, no, Pong video game. And then they disconnect the uh, physical controller. So it's actually wirelessly through the brain. And it's still working. And it's so fascinating. And, can, yeah. And for people that don't know what Neuralink is, it's uh, Elon Musk's machine where he's trying to connect people together. Um, it's just, uh, it's literally what it sounds like. Neuralink. Yeah. Neurological link, your brainwave, you link it to other people's brainwaves, right? Yeah. Um, they put uh, wireless electrodes in people's brains and they created ways of implanting these uh, devices faster and uh, more numerously, so you can record from more regions. And they made algorithms that sort the data and make sense of it. And so it's a super interesting company. Um, 
it's, they're not the only ones doing this. There are other companies like BlackRock, Microsystems, and Ripple, and they also make uh, neural devices nice. and neural stimulators. And this whole field is like in its nascent stage. It's going to be blossoming, and there's going to be so many cool experiments going forward. Um, Let me know if you need any sales managers. I got you, man. Yeah. Now, nah, that just stuff sells itself. I don't know if I want something planted in my brain, but like maybe like a cap. Yeah, no, I would hold off on Yeah, I would definitely hold off on the, the yeah. yeah, I don't want anything planted in my brain, dude. The only reason we do it for epilepsy patients is it helps us identify where the seizure is coming from. Yeah. But if you have a healthy brain, let's just see the studies on safety, efficacy, and just be um, like safe with it. Yeah. Because uh, the only thing they would be able to do with a healthy brain is try to improve it further and you want to make sure that works first rather than uh, just yeah. randomly poking around. I, I think probably people will try to just take their healthy brain and try to take it to the full capacity or more efficiency at that point. Yeah. Um, oh, but back to your original question on consciousness. Yes. So, so from the neurological side, we're trying to understand sufficiency and necessity. necessity. We studied World War II patients and we mapped out what regions of the brain mean. We uh, studied uh, patients where we put um, uh, metal wires in the brain for like years upon mm-hmm. time. And we could like, uh, so sorry, the patients were studying uh, where we put these electrodes in first have like motor deficiencies. So they would be like unable to move their arms or they would wildly move their arms. And the reason why we did that is because the motor cortex is really well defined. And I keep pointing my hand to the top of my head because it's like about the middle of your head. There's like this slice in the brain horizontally this way, um, axially, if you know um, image uh, registration from, terms. Right, if you're looking forward from left to right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so there's that strip of neurons on the top of your head that control movements, and it's very well defined. So if we can go into the hand portion of that and we stimulate that, it'll cause like a finger flick. Uh, and... Um, if we, uh, uh, so um, when people have like motor deficiencies, you can directly stimulate those parts of the brain to counteract that. And uh, another part of the brain that we stimulate to counteract that is the uh, basal ganglia. Mm-hmm. We do that for Parkinson's patients because Parkinson, you lack like the excitatory neurons, you lack dopaminergic neurons. These are neurons that release the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is so important in the system. And so we target this area and we uh, can, uh, um, sorry, I'm, I need to sneeze. So I need oh, to yeah, yeah. You want me to get you a napkin? You good? No, I'm good. Uh, so we can target this area, shock it, and uh, actually show improvements in how they uh, move. Like their hand will have tremors. And then once it's shocked, it'll slowly stop and be stable and they can do things. It's mind-blowingly amazing because the only other option was uh, drugs, specifically L-DOPA. And uh, and L-DOPA is a miracle drug, but unfortunately, it gets weaker over time because your uh, brain becomes less responsive Ah, to dopamine. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, And uh, if that wasn't the case, that would be a great treatment for Parkinson's. Um. Let me ask you this. So, so, so I've been, uh, I do a lot of like, uh, breathing classes, ice baths, meditation, inside out. Um, I've, I've been reading studies. Uh, it's a famous piano study where uh, people that don't really know how to play piano, um, in their mind, they imagine themselves playing piano and they build neural networks. So they actually become better at playing piano or, uh, let's just say like swimmers or runners, um, or people that do sports, um, they, they mentally exercise. Like you say, they're doing push-ups or, you know, like curls, and then their muscles actually grow. How does that happen? So, um, if I remember correctly, or is this there different? are two parts to muscle activation. There's actually the number of muscle fibers that create the force. And so, that's when you flex and you're like, ah, oh, that's where that strength is coming from. Yeah. Uh, and then there are the neurons that interweave between all these muscle fibers, and they activate the neurons themselves. And so when you, uh, when you like actually practice flexing, uh, when you actually go through the muscle of working out, yeah. you're both shearing the uh, fibers that create the strength, but you're also uh, training the neurons that activate those fibers to more strongly activate them. 
you're making like the uh, your brain's connection to your muscles better so that uh, it can better activate these fibers and create a stronger response the next time you need it. Or you're like training it so that it has uh, muscle memory so that you can remember how to play the piano. And then on the pa playing the piano part, there's another neuron in your brain. It's called a mirror neuron. And this is like when you see someone do an activity, mm -hmm. um, then you like physically learn that process. These mirror neurons are responsible for that. They look at that other person, they activate in doing the activity, and it gives you that sense of like learning from someone else. So that's like the fundamental basis for uh, for like children. Uh, like you're the younger brother, you see your older brother go get a cookie from the cookie jar and get yeah. scolded by mom. And then you're like, oh, I shouldn't do that. Like, yeah, it's okay. that learning from watching, which is okay. so powerful. Or you learn, you see your dad drink and yell at your mom, and then you end up growing up and doing the same thing. That happens too, right? Mirror neuron. Yeah. That's just like the bad side of it. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. You were uh, talking about mirror neurons. Um, you learn some. Um, there's external factors. So I'm doing a Guatemala in August. Yeah. And I'm doing a five day. It's called a dark room meditation where you're in a dark room. There's no people. There's no sound. There's no light. You can't have your phone, anything. You're just in that dark room for five days, bro. Yeah. What happens neurologically to you at that point? Um, don't know too much about it. I just know that um, the ideas of hallucinations. One hundred percent. I actually don't think that happens. No, you don't think no, so. No, I think that's people's anxiety getting to them. That they're in this room that's so quiet and like cornered. Yeah. And they might feel claustrophobic. Yeah. So I think that's just anxiety getting to them. But. Um, because, like, I've seen scientists do that. Like, uh, there's this channel, Veritasium. I, I love this guy. He uh, has a degree in education and physics, and he also does something similar. But uh, by the end of the experience, he was totally fine. It just seems like it might be a anxiety thing. And it's not, like, that's not, like, fake. Like, if you get so anxious that you hallucinate, that is also your mind doing something to you, which is also fascinating that that can ha happen. I don't know if that's like because of the room. I need to see more testing for that. I'll let you know what happens, man. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're okay. Ari, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'll be fine completely. Dude. I mean, I meditate for a couple. Of, I have to do a pre-screening because yeah. like they want to make sure you don't have any like uh, like mental issues. You don't oh, have any yeah. addictions. You don't have any psychotic episodes. Yeah. You haven't tried to commit suicide because when you go in there, you yeah. don't know what happens. Dude. You're just like trying to hang on to your sanity. <laughs> yeah. So I repay for it. I'm going to do it. Um, but it does sound like a good experience. Like it is. It is. be introspective in that room and be like, oh, this is who I am as a person. Yeah. In that time. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. There's other studies done with sensory deprivation tanks. Are yeah. you guys familiar with that at all? Um, a little bit just from like studies in the military, but not in the way you're thinking. Not in the way I'm thinking. Okay. No. I'm going out. So the way I'm thinking is like we were studying how effective is torture. Uh -huh. on people because uh when someone's trying to uh nuke your world right. you want to get the information and stop the nuke going off yes so we truly believe for a long time that torture was the way to go but then we uh, uh psychologist who was talking to um students uh in this like we like recreated like a torture camp in america and to study the effects of torture on soldiers and what we what they found out was that uh, when you talk to the soldiers after they go through some intense training, they like won't remember anything that happened for the past like thirty minutes. Like it's crazy to the point where you ask uh, like uh, everyone who was the director of the camp, and uh, at the time this doctor who wasn't at the camp for the whole time those students were there comes in and uh, um, he just got back from vacation. And he comes in to help check up on the soldiers. And like uh, about 40% of them point at that doctor as if he was the director. Like they straight up, he wasn't even at the camp the whole time they were doing this thing. That's how bad uh, torture and those kinds of methods are. Because it floods your brain with so much stress. Your brain floods itself with so much norepinephrine, which is like adrenaline in your blood. But in your brain, it helps you forget and fail to make memories. Is that like the fight or flight response in a sense? Yeah. Outside, like outside from your adrenal cortex? Yeah. 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 
when you're like in that scared mode and you're trying to survive, yeah, that is what it'll do. But inside your brain, it'll pre- in really high concentrations, it'll prevent you from making memories. And that's crazy because this is why a lot of neuroscientists are against torture because when you fail to make the memory, they'll just tell you anything you want to hear. Yeah, yeah. And that, like, that's be, why interrogations yeah. suck, bro. Like police interrogations because yeah. most people throw them in that room. After a while, they'll just tell you anything they want just to get out of that situation. Yeah. And eyewitness testimony isn't great either. Yeah. That, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about that. Like, yeah. <laughs> we're talking about him earlier. That, that's like the worst. Yeah. Because <laughs> you ask 18 different people to tell you 18 different things. Yeah. And it's so crazy how the brain does that. Yeah. And it's because we, like, in some sense, consciousness is just a series of hallucinations. You're hallucinating the, this perception of the world. Uh, you're hallucinating the sounds that I'm saying to your ear. Like all of this is just a series of really great hallucinations that come together and make your picture of the world. And then when you really need to get like a concrete fact in there, mm-hmm. your brain will like overwrite it when you remember that event. Your brain will misremember, misperceive, missee. Like uh, you should do this test on your own. You can find like a dot on uh, the web just Mm -hmm. like a blank screen and a dot in the center and then you move your eye field until the dot disappears and the reason why it disappears is because all the neurons in the back of your eye are coming out through the fovea into your brain and it creates a blind spot and you don't see a blind spot in your eye right now you because your brain is filling in that gap yes you're misperceiving a part of your world right now in both eyes and That's well. you don't even see that. So it's, you're just constantly hallucinating what's going around around you. And it's like, That's crazy. it's fascinating how those hallucinations can go wrong. I, I do the complete opposite. Uh, there's a dot. I just stare at it for long periods of time because it's like concentration meditation to lower your brain waves and just calm down and just concentrate on your breathing. But that's something completely different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. Just to relax yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Just to relax yourself. Out. It's just like a different type of meditation that people yeah. do. But back to the eyewitness thing on, and consciousness, it's it's so crazy. We don't know fully what consciousness is. We just know parts of it. Like we know that musicians are more conscious of music than the average person. If you ask the musician what a note is, they yeah. will be like, oh. That's the note. And then if you play it slightly off key, they'll be like, oh, that's slightly off key. But a normal person would be like, oh, that I can't tell 100, 1 over 256 of a difference between the two notes. Whereas a musician would be able to be like, oh, that's slightly off, not quite right. I, I, Is that consciousness? Is that slight difference in perception a change in musical consciousness? That I, I would think so. I've actually taken music classes yeah. and I was a DJ. So I've, I've kind of tuned myself to, like, quality of sound. Yeah. So, like, when things are, like, uh, not that clear, I can tell the difference. I'm like, hey, dude, the sounds I was like, no, no, it sounds the same. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So you're more conscious than me in that aspect. And then maybe, like, a mathematician who can think of, like, a 4D model of, like, some object mm-hmm. and uh, manipulate it in their brain, they might be more conscious in visualization and uh, geometric manipulation so that's kind of how I see the world that like experts like a- elite level athletes have better like reaction time so they're more conscious in the moment so those kinds of things also are also true like how do we define consciousness uh, well different experts are more conscious in different things okay yeah. yeah that makes sense okay so I think you mentioned something earlier oh, you did mention it before uh, it was about the fifth dimension um, there's a theory. No, you mentioned the fifth dimension. Did I? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You said there's some stuff. Oh, I think I did. And then uh, you're going to elaborate. So so, so there's some uh, theories. Uh, actually, it's not a theory. It's kind of like a, people have been proving it with neuroscience, where if you collapse time and space in your head, that you forget who you are, where you are, you kind of like go somewhere else. Is there any research that you've come across about that? Where like you pretty much go deep inside your own mind, bro, and your subconscious. Um, so the whole losing track of time thing, kind of, there's this idea that it takes eight, it takes about 80 milliseconds for like light to hit your eyes, to go into your brain and be perceived as what it is. Like this is light reflecting off the table, hitting my eyes. And then my brain goes table there. 
right? Yes. And then one idea is that if that 80 milliseconds gets longer or like out of tune mm -hmm. with the rest of how your brain uh, syncs up with that, mm -hmm. then you have schizophrenia. I haven't seen many follow-up studies on that, but uh, it sounds right. It sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, but outside of that, I don't know too much about timing. Like okay. I can tell you how like different brain regions communicate with each other. Um, and that timing is critical to why our brain sizes are the way they are mm -hmm. and uh, how different regions communicate um, with timing. Like there's this thing called synaptic time dependent plasticity. And so let's break that down. Uh, synaptic just means a uh, release of neurotransmitter. Time dependent means you got to release that neurotransmitter at a specific time. And then plasticity means you can create a change in the receiving neuron. And so uh, if you, uh, so based on that study, if uh, you have two neurons, A and B, yeah. and uh, B fires first, and then A immediately after, okay. that means A and B, and A and B are connected. So you have A talking to B, the B talks first, and then A talks. Then uh, the connection from A to B gets weaker. So you lose the ability for A to talk to B. And then uh, the uh, vice versa is true. If A is connected to B, A talks first, then B talks immediately after, then A gets stronger, more uh, strongly connected to B. And this is how you learn. This is, is that repetition? Yeah, yeah. And you do it multiple times. You do it multiple times. And you get learning. And that's awesome. Because then uh, it's useful in two ways. You want to get smarter. You do stimulation that causes A to talk first and then B to talk after. If you want, if you have someone with PTSD who's having trauma, you want them to forget that memory. So you cause B to talk first and then A. Oh, okay. So now you have a way to treat people. It's a great idea. You dilute the, 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 the emotion in yeah. a sense. Yeah. You, you water it down in a sense. Yeah. And so that's uh, synaptic time-dependent plasticity theory. It's awesome. And it seems to be pretty true uh, at the neuron level. And we're trying to see if it's true at the, like neuronal population of cells level. Okay. Like if you have like 10,000 neurons talking, is it still true? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So uh, let me ask you this one. So you said, I mean, you, you keep referencing like military research. Yeah. Um, people that are like stressed out, uh, the military has this training. It's called box breathing. I've never where heard of that. pretty much you just breathe in, you breathe out, and you just calm down. And, and like, because when, uh, I guess your brain waves, when you're in a stressful situation, it's like uh, A. Uh, a brainwaves or alpha, alpha, alpha. Brainwaves? yeah, or beta. They're alpha and they're beta okay. brainwaves. Okay, right, and then you're able to like calm it down yeah, when yeah. you're breathing. Yeah. How does that work per se? Um, so uh, I can't tell you exactly how that mechanism works, um, but I can tell you like in general how it works. In general, and it seems like your physiology and your uh, men let's call it mental consciousness. Uh huh. Um, interact and that if you're breathing quickly and yeah. your heart rate is really fast then you'll be anxious and stressed and then if you uh, just calm that breathing down and slow it down and uh, calm your heart rate then you'll relax your anxiety and be more clear-headed now that seems to be true both in humans and in animal models animal models too yeah do you think that has to do with fight or flight? I mean, it probably does. Maybe. Uh, I just think it's more that, like, because um, we usually just think of, like, oh, the brain's doing one thing, mm -hmm. the heart's doing another, the lungs are doing something. But, like, in us, it's all interacting all at the same time. And so uh, it's always, uh, one is always affecting the other. Um, okay. Have you heard the br the heart is the second brain? Have you heard that? Yeah. Is that true? Well, I also heard that for the gut. Too. That's the third, apparently. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to correct you. I mean, I mean, there is a lot of evidence showing that what you eat affects how you think, too. Like a bio and yeah. things like that? Okay. Yeah, because like half the neurotransmitters released in your body are also released in your gut. Serotonin is in the gut. Yeah. If you feel like you ate something that's uh, really bad, you immediately start vomiting and feel sick to your gut. There's clearly like nerve endings there that your brain... Uh, talks to um, 
but do I know the specific details beyond that? Not really. You just heard. Uh, yeah, yeah okay, I just I just remember uh, like the gut biome is still being studied. When I did my masters, I created a, I helped worked on a, like this um, model of the kidneys, and so uh, um, in that. Uh, it's not my research that's important. It's I just happened to work in a lab that worked on gut. Mm -hmm. And so they grew like this lactobacillus, which is a friendly gut bacteria, mm -hmm. on these Petri dishes. And they showed that like like different – like the frostings of cupcakes can be toxic to your gut because uh, there's a molecule called titanium dioxide, mm -hmm. which on a macro scale is just like a metal block. It's fine. That at a nanoscale, when you eat micro amounts of it, um, changes how the chemistry works, and it becomes toxic. And so, like, it, uh, like my old PI got death threats from cupcake manufacturers. About this. <laughs> really? Yeah. But his, I mean, he wasn't out to get the cupcake company. He was just proving no. facts. Yeah, she was proving facts. She. Right? Yeah. But um, yeah, it's death crazy. threats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow, they want to kill publish. It? So, so pretty much, uh, if it's if it's toxic for you, and it goes up to your brain, it's not going to function as well. Um, so, it has to get through this thing called the BBB. But yes, if it gets if it's toxic for you, and it, the toxic substance gets in the brain, generally that's not good. But your brain has this uh, BBB, the blood brain barrier, it, because that used to that's such a big problem that your brain created like this, like. Um, micrometer level like gate all around the connections of the blood vessels that can go into the brain just to filter that out and prevent that from happening and then it has you know how you have neurons that do the actual thinking mm -hmm. there are also supporting cells called glia that like keep the neurons running well they're like get the uh water cooler and the uh power to your computer and the fan that keeps it cool and the uh uh, they're moisture like, remover to keep the computer dry. They're all like the supporting parts. Like the line, I mean, like a defensive line to the quarterback? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And so they like filter out the blood and only let the glucose come through or the necessary proteins. It's not perfect because there are things called prions that get through. Uh -huh. But, uh, and other things like uh, you could have uh, um, uh, trauma or scarring or aneurysm. It's not perfect, but. It's there, and it's because it's so critical to protect the brain. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, what's like the craziest far-fetched theory or uh, like uh, research that you've come across? Um, there's a few. Oh, uh, top three: uh, foreign accent syndrome blows my mind. Foreign accent syndrome. Is yeah. that like what we were watching on uh, Moon Knight? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it like multiple so, personality disorder? Uh, no. It's where uh, it's only um, where you get into an accident. You speak uh, English right now. You get into an accident and you only speak French now. And you speak... And like, I never spoke French before? Or you speak uh, English with a French accent. Sorry. Like you just cannot speak English the way you used to. Okay. And did I speak French before? Um. No, no. Like, if you spoke French before, yeah. then you'll speak French with, like, a weird accent. Okay. Uh, you won't learn a new language, but you will speak it with an accent of, like, another uh, okay. um, area. Okay, it's that's crazy weird. that that yeah. happens, but it happens when you undergo trauma. So that's one thing that's crazy. Okay. Another thing is there's this guy called Oliver Sacks. Dr. Oliver Sacks is a neurologist. Uh, um, and he uh, had lots of patients come into his clinic. And one of the patients that he saw is uh, this man who had damage to his ability to recognize uh, people's faces. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. So the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. And what's the third one? Uh, and the third one would be when you uh, cut the brain in half, the corpus callosotomy. Um you'll have two different personalities in your head. And that's mind-blowing because it breaks down the idea of who are you. Like, are you the left side of your brain? Are you the right side of your brain? Or is there now two different people in your brain from the original person? Yeah. Like, you gave me an example. Uh, they'll point out a truck. Yeah. And they'll light the truck. 
and then uh, they're like, what do you like more? And they'll point out a fire truck to like the fire truck more because yeah. it's two different people. Yeah. So what he's, uh, what Karam's referencing is uh, if you put like a divider in front of them and like on the one side, you'll ask them uh, what's in, uh, think of something. And on the other side, you ask them to point to something and they'll point to like a fire truck, but on the, uh, the side, they'll uh, talk about the fire truck, but they won't know why they did that like yeah cool and 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 like go ahead uh, another thing is like one hand will like button the buttons on their shirt Uh while the other hand will like unbutton them at the same time yeah like one after the other it's usually just rebutting yeah 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 but yeah it's like two different brains in your head it's mind-blowing that is mind-blowing and then like (laughs) yeah yeah i would not want that to happen to me or you yeah on well, a, they did that back in the day to stop epilepsy if, like, one side they uh-huh. had seizures. But, uh, yeah, from that, we learned a lot about the brain. The brain is just so fascinating. Yeah. The more we learn, the more, like, crazier it gets. Yeah, mom, no, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to learn as we go. And, yeah, you've been a lot of help. Last question, brother. Okay. I always ask people this question at the end. Um, what is one thing someone can do to just better themselves? Um, they say they're in a sitchy, s- shitty situation or they're depressed. They're not in the right state of mind. What advice would you give them? Then you're, you're an expert in the brain. What advice would you give them? If they were clinically depressed? Not clinically depressed. They say they're sad. They're a bad place. They're broke or something like that. Um, they want to help themselves. Uh, speaking from like, a, you know, someone that's an expert in the brain. Um, get some sunshine. Get some dopamine in you. Yeah, like what, what advice would you give them? There's a bunch of things they can do. Uh, one thing is like, uh, there's this idea. I think it's called Anchorage. I might be using that incorrectly, but there's this idea where um, where you are determines how you behave, and that if you were to literally just uproot yourself and go to another area altogether yeah with different resources, you could completely change the way you behave. Yeah, I've heard that so many times. Um, during a study, uh, the college students that study in the, in the place that they're going to take the test, they do a lot better. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that the same concept? Um, not really, because that's more about, uh, like, uh, well, yeah, I guess that is the same concept. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Versus, like, you don't study on the, while you're watching TV. Yeah, yeah. When you study in the, in the classroom that you're going to take the exam, you yeah. just do way better. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that is the same. Uh, I need to double check that and get back to you, but I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the same. So, so your advice is just get out of the environment. Yeah, one is get out of the environment. Two is exercise. Exercise is so important because it uh, causes your neurons to release something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and this just causes your neurons to create more connections and to create some neurogenesis. Mostly, just create more connections and a more strongly connected brain is like a healthier brain um it also reduces like stress it improves your ability to get oxygen to the brain exercise is so important um uh and i'm learning that myself because i put, took up boxing recently did you yeah boxing's good man I'm trying to get better at it trying to get my uh good cardio better good it's just there's too many studies to ignore how wonderful exercising is if there was a pill that could reduce stress make you smarter make you happier and uh give you a longer life yeah everyone would take that pill today it's called meditation yeah well (laughs) the uh, pill i'm talking about is exercise yeah yeah i know But meditation also helps yeah meditation helps which not every neuroscientist believed in meditation back <gasps> in the day but now it was uh, a lot of them are coming to it because it seems to be effective about time yeah but like when it first when we when uh people were first talking about yogis and relaxing they were like oh what is this hocus pocus hocus pocus yeah this, yeah, yeah. yeah yo yo but like it turns out meditation helps reduce uh stress helps calm yourself helps keep you clear headed like there are clear uh, benefits of meditation, exercise, eating healthy. Um, uh, oh, and one really important thing is uh, really trying hard at something that you want to get good at. That also seems to have long-lasting effects because uh, 
when people like quit their jobs and when they retire at yeah, 65. Yeah, they die <laughs> five years later, right? Uh, they die, but like another thing that happens is that they also get dementia because they're not using their brains as hard for like their job. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, so uh, like working hard at something that keeps you mentally active is just as equally needed for a healthy long Got life it. as like physically working out. Like either you use it or you lose it mentally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, Just like that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. That's, that, that also subs up something called Hebb's postulate, uh, which is where that STDP thing I was talking about way before was coming from. Uh -huh. Yeah. Like that's a great uh, synthesis of this whole talk. Cool. Use it, lose it. If you do it in the wrong timing, uh, things can go awry. Like, oh, Nice. Great. Cool, brother. Thanks for jumping around, but yeah. I appreciate you coming on my podcast. Yeah. That was awesome, man. Thank Dude. you again. Yeah, no problem. Um, and yeah, everybody have a great day. Don't forget to subscribe, and we'll see you on our next episode.